Well, good morning, Living Water. How are we doing this morning? It is a great day to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I trust you all had a good Christmas. Who had an amazing Christmas? Raise your hand. I know that I did. I got to hang out with family, hang out with my little nephew. That was pretty fun. Mom took way too many pictures and fussed over the kid way too much. That being said, it was a great Christmas. I hope you had the same as well. We just have one announcement this morning before we get started, and that is we want to remember our offering. There are several ways that you can give to Living Water Community Church. You can go to 84321 and follow the prompts. You can go to forallwhothirst.churchcenter.com forward slash giving. And as always, offering baskets for physical gifts will be passed during the first song. We also want to remember that at this time, we are trying to pay off the remainder of the Ebenezer campaign. Stewardship has graciously uh, graciously promised to match us up to $32,000. So if you would like to give to the Ebenezer campaign, we ask that you would write that in the memo line. I think that's all that we have for this morning for announcements. Let's open up this time with a word of prayer. Bow your heads if you would with me. Father God, we come before you today thanking you for the opportunity to gather in your name. We come before you this morning with hearts of joy and with hearts of thanks because this morning, Father, we remember your son, Jesus Christ. This season that has just ended yesterday with Christmas was all about building up to the birth of your son, Jesus, who would grow up to die only on a cross for your glory and for our sins. And so, Father, this morning we remember that and our hearts are full in this season. And Father, because our hearts are full, because it is a season of thanksgiving and praise and worship for the gift that you have given us, we ask that your spirit, because it's moving in this place, would touch all of our hearts here and those watching online. And we ask that we would meet your spirit where it is already at work. In short, Father, may this day be not only uplifting to us, but more importantly, may it be dedicated and full of praise and worship to you. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning, Living Water. I hope you all had a Merry Christmas, just like Pastor Jesse said. This new sermon series I am especially excited for, because as some of you know, I did not grow up in the church. Um, I didn't have that lifelong love of Christ like a lot of you are still left with. Um, and a while back, Pastor Jesse and I were discussing the Ten Commandments, and there is a specific line in one of them that I had never heard of before. And he was shocked. He's like, what? And I said, yeah, I, I didn't know that that was one of the commandments. And right then and there, he goes, well, guess we're doing a sermon series on it. So you're welcome for inspiring the sermon series. <laughs> but so we're starting with the first one, of course. Um, and I just think it's so relevant to our mission statement. And just to remind you, I know we always have new people every Sunday. So Living Water's mission statement is seeking to follow Jesus by loving God and loving others. And like the first commandment says, we love God above all else. And with that, let's stand and start singing and worship the Lord.
congregation of Jesus Christ, you may be seated. Our scripture for this morning actually comes from two different passages this morning. The first being Mark 12, verses 28 through 31. The second being Deuteronomy 5, verses 6 and 7. And as Amanda said, this is the start of our series on the Ten Commandments. So I ask that you would turn your Bibles over to Mark chapter 12. We're going to be reading verses 28 through 31, and then Deuteronomy 5, verses 6 through 7. Starting with the Mark passage, in verse 28, it says this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. And noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And then from our Deuteronomy passage, verses 6 and 7, says this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Let's bow our heads in a time of prayer before our Lord this morning. Father God, we come before you thanking you so very much. We come before you praising your name, just like the song we sang said, Father, great are you, Lord. And that is so true, Father, because you are great indeed. So, Father, this morning we bow before you, we sit and stand before you in this prayer asking for your blessing upon this time. Because, Father, this morning we continue to praise you, we continue to worship you, and we continue to learn more about you. Specifically now, Father, diving into your word and your guidance for our lives. And so, Father, this morning, as we dive into your word, as we open your scripture, we ask that you would bless the mouth of the one who speaks on your scripture, and you would open up all our hearts so we might hear your truth within us. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. It is a pleasure to worship with you all this morning, praising our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we said before, it is the day after Christmas, and I hope that all of your celebrations were focused not just on food and family and gifts, but were focused on that most precious gift, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we come to this end of the Christmas season, today we find ourselves at the start of something new. We find ourselves at the start of a new series, as Amanda said, focusing on the Ten Commandments. And why are we focusing on the Ten Commandments, you may ask? Well, there are actually three reasons. First, Amanda takes the blame, as she said. Sorry. Sorry. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Amanda. <laughs> Second, the reason we're looking at the Ten Commandments is there just so happens to be ten Sundays between Christmas and the start of Lent, the portion of the year where we prepare ourselves for Easter Sunday, which means there's one Sunday for each commandment. So the timing lined up a little too well for me to consider this a mere coincidence this year. But also the third reason that I felt led to focus on the Ten Commandments, and I think this is the most important reason. The third reason is because the Ten Commandments are a way in which we learn to follow God's will for our lives. The Ten Commandments are a way in which we learn to follow God through His direct commands. In other words, the Ten Commandments series that we're going to undertake is aimed at guiding us in how to live well in relationship with God and in relationship with others. So in short, the Ten Commandments help steer us towards him and his will for our lives. And so as we start this series that focuses on God's will for us in the coming year and beyond, we start off by attempting to look at the first and greatest commandment. And right when we do that, we seem to immediately run into a problem. And this problem comes when we compare our Mark and our Deuteronomy passage. First of all, our Mark passage in Mark 12, 29 through 31. This is Jesus answering the question of which of the commandments is the most important. 
This is what Jesus said. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater, there is no commandment greater than these. Well, clearly here, Jesus states and says that the most important commandment is to love the Lord with your entirety. And the second commandment is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And in fact, the book of Matthew puts the supposed problem even more front and center when it says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Let's remember that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The first and greatest commandment. Clearly, Jesus says that the most important commandment is the first commandment commandment, which is to love the Lord with your entire being. Well, clearly there is no problem thus far, but what happens if we look at the first commandment as found in the book of Deuteronomy, verses 6 and 7. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And when we compare these two statements, the statement of Jesus saying the first commandment is to love the Lord and the second commandment is to love the neighbor. And yet scripture in Deuteronomy says the first commandment is to have no other gods before the Lord. And by the way, loving thy neighbor is not a commandment. All of a sudden, we reach the nexus of the problem, which is that throughout many centuries, Critics of the Bible and Jesus in general will point out that these passages in Mark are proof that Jesus Christ doesn't know his commandments because his commandments and the statement he says here are two commandments seem to not line up with the Ten Commandments. So what is Jesus doing here? Does Jesus not know his Ten Commandments? Well, of course, Jesus knows his Ten Commandments. Let's not be ridiculous here. <laughs> of course, Jesus knows his Ten Commandments. But what he's doing here is reframing the Ten Commandments. He changes the Ten Commandments from something legalistic into something that is relational. In other words, Jesus separates the Ten Commandments into two sections. And we actually have a chart, if we could show that real quick. He separates the Ten Commandments into two distinct, distinct sections. God, hence the commandment, don't lie, don't covet. So what he does is he separates the commandments into two distinct sections. The first four being how to love God and grow in relationship with the commandments. Christ turns the law into a relationship. In other words, what Jesus does here is to imply that the Ten Commandments are not something to be simply obeyed just because their guidance gives us the moral way to live, but instead the Ten Commandments are ways in which we can honor God and one another growing in relationship with our Lord and each other. We can pull that down now. Thank you. For Jesus, the first four commandments are about growing in our love for God more each day, and the last six are about growing in our love for each other more each day. In short, these commandments then, according to Christ, are not simple rules to just live by, but they are opportunities to honor God and honor one another. This is why Jesus says the first section, the first four commandments are the greatest because in doing them, we are actually loving the Lord and growing closer to him all the time. Amen. And when we turn to the Ten Commandments, when we turn them from just rules to follow into what I like to call relationship builders, we start to see the importance of the first of the Ten Commandments, which we're looking at, to, at today, which is, thou shall not have any other gods before me. Again, from Deuteronomy 5. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And upon this initial first glance, this commandment, don't have any gods before him, seems pretty simple and self-explanatory. Because after all, most of us here are Christians. So of course, God is the most important deity in our life. Of course, we're not walking around worshiping false gods like the sun god Ra or Baal or Asherah like the Israelites did. So of course, our Lord is the only true God. So therefore, this one should be pretty easy to follow, right? This one is a given, an easy one to live by. After all, the entire point of this commandment is to state that in our lives, the Lord is the most important thing above all else. And as Christians, this should be the easiest one for us to follow. It should be simple. But in reality, I would submit to you that although this should be the easiest one to live by, the fact is, this is probably the one commandment that we actually break the most. Thou shall have no other gods before me is the one that we tend to break the most. And in fact, most times we break this commandment, not through, we do it not through radical worship of some false god. We don't do it by putting something overwhelmingly ungodly in our life, but most times we break this commandment by putting something else, oftentimes unexpected in our life, above the importance of God. In other words, most times we break this commandment not by blatantly sinning and worshiping something false, but by putting something else as more important than him. I'll give you a perfect example. I'm a pastor, right? You all know this? At least I would hope after five and a half years you do. So I'm a pastor. And I'll admit something to you right now. My entire calling, my entire career, my entire job is to know God. My entire job is to pursue God's will. But what often ends up happening when you're in the pastorate is you end up over-focusing on the church. And what ends up happening, at least when you're in a pastor, and it's not just myself, it's other pastors, we all struggle with this, is that the work of the church unintentionally becomes more important than the will of God. And by doing so, unfortunately, this is one of my many, many struggles because I'm not perfect, my small g God ends up being the church rather than following big G God, Yahweh, and his will for myself and for the church. And this is not something I do intentionally, nor is it something I do maliciously, after all, Ultimately, I want the church to function well so that lives may be changed and hearts may turn to Jesus Christ. But the devil has a way of tempting us away from God's glory and focusing on us putting other things above God's lordship. And unfortunately, this sin, this struggle that I just told you about is not just my own. Because in all of our lives, there is a temptation to put God second and other things first. For some of us, like myself, our work becomes our small g God. And we spend more time thinking about work than we do working towards God's will. Here's a hard one to accept. For others, family becomes the primary focus of our life. And in doing so, we put the care of others above our faith in Jesus Christ. For still others, we tend to focus our hobbies and pastimes as the most important thing. We spend more time watching TV or playing video games or hunting and fishing than we do reading the Bible. And so, my friends, as I said earlier, whether we intend to or not, 
we all have a tendency to put other things in our lives above God. And in doing so, those small g gods overtake the importance of the Lord. Whether intentionally or not, we all really have trouble following the first commandment. We all have difficulty with having no other gods before it. But I pose a question to you. Rather than us sitting here feeling guilty about it or us feeling ashamed for the way in which we have not upheld the first commandment, instead of feeling shame, what would it look like if we, as God's people, changed the way we approached the first commandment? What if instead of a legalistic rule to live by, we actually followed Jesus' intention and turned the first commandment into a relationship builder with him? What would that look like and how does that happen? Well, I think the answer comes in the first verse of the commandment. Verse 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And you may be wondering why this verse is the most important. Well, this part of the verse is very important because it often gets overlooked. And what we have to remember is that these commandments were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb, just after the Israelites had left their bondage in Egypt. So the Lord here is reminding the Israelites what he had done for them. Now here is the most important part of this. He's not reminding the Israelites what he has done for them to guilt them into obedience as if to say, look what I've done for you, you owe me. But instead, he's stating this to them to remind them of the blessing of freedom that he has bestowed upon them. In other words, this commandment is not just obey me because I am the Lord and I deserve it, which is true and he does, but it also turns this commandment into a freedom of putting God first in life. In other words, our entire lives, our entire society, our entire world is bound to sin, and this commandment is saying, I give you freedom to not be bound in that sin, but to put me first. In short, we're not only commanded to put God first, but we're blessed to put him first because the creator of everything saw it fit to choose you as a child of him. And we know this by the very thing we celebrated just this week. We know this by the promise and birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ who was born only to die on a cross for our sins, which, just like the Israelites and their blessing of freedom, acts as our blessing of freedom. Because now, by his sacrifice, we who have Jesus Christ as our Savior are also blessed with freedom. Freedom from eternal sin, freedom from eternal death, Freedom from eternal bondage. And it's this freedom that has been granted to us, allows us to say boldly and without hesitation through the power of the Holy Spirit. It allows us to say, yes, I am a child of God. Yes, Jesus is my Savior. Yes, I embrace the gift of eternity with Him. And because all of this is true, I will not be bound by the sin of putting other things above the Lord. I will not be imprisoned with the desire to put anything before Him. I will not be chained with the shackles of earthly bondage that tells me to value everything else above the Lord. But instead, I, as a child of God, choose to embrace the freedom of Christ. And in every situation, I embrace that freedom of putting the Lord first in all I say and do. And my friends, when that is our mantra, when that is our hope, when that is our joy, when we embrace the reality of the first commandment, turning it from a legalistic rule of life 
to the start of a true relationship with the Lord. In doing so, the first commandment turns from a law into a gift. The first commandment to put no other gods before him is no longer a rule, but an act of loving freedom. This is the first commandment, to have no other gods before him. And when we embrace the freedom of putting him first in a world that tells us to put him second, then we are truly loving the Lord with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Sunday of 2021. Today is the last Sunday of this year. Next Sunday will be January 2nd. Next Sunday will start us off on a new year. And as we approach this next year, my challenge to all of us, you, me, everyone, is this. In the year 2022, let's be the church that embraces the freedom of putting the Lord at the forefront of all we do. And how do we do this? We do this by being the church that holds each other accountable by constantly asking one another, are we doing this thing for our glory or are we doing this thing to add to God's glory? Let's be the church that regardless of whether it seems that the year to come is full of struggles or whether it's full of blessings, whatever it holds, let's be that church that in everything we say and do, we have the boldness to act through both word and action, the first of the commandments, and proclaim to a world that wants to put God second, we proclaim we are living water, we are children of God. We follow Jesus Christ with our entire hearts. And this year and beyond, we take a stand against those who wish to destroy the name of the Lord. Because this year, we, living water, put God first. Yes, sir. Friends, let's make that covenant with one another. Let's do it now. Let's make that covenant with one another that we are the church who boldly asks each other, holding each other accountable, are we in our individual lives and in our church decisions doing this for our glory or are we doing this thing because it adds to God's glory? Friends, in this new year, let's be the church who boldly in all we say and do put the Lord first. Let's be that church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we as your people have a tendency to speak as though we are putting you first. But our actions, in fact, show that we put you second or sometimes even lower on the list. Father God, even the things that you wish to make holy, such as the gift of your church, the gift of family, the gift of friends, all of your blessings, even those things which you intend to make holy for us, Father, we have a tendency to be tempted by the devil and give in to our natures and use them for our own glory rather than yours. And in doing so, Father, we put you second and put our glory first. But Father, as we look forward to a new year, as we have just celebrated the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, and as we have the promise of his salvation for all those who believe in him, as we look forward to a new year, Father, we pray that we, as living water, whether we're present today, tomorrow, or the next day, whatever the year brings, we pray, Father, that we would be your church the people of God, who in everything we say and do, say we do this for your glory, holding each other accountable and putting you first. Father God, bless us with that. We ask that we would be that church, that in the midst of everything this year may bring, 
this church, its people, your people, would always put you first. Bless us with that, Father. We ask you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, all these things. Amen. One of the things we like to do on a regular basis here at Living Water is open up with a time of congregational prayer. And I think this prayer is very fitting on this Sunday because 2022 went very quickly, or 2021 went very quickly. But there was a lot of us here and a lot of us who aren't present here today who had a very difficult year. And so I think as we look at the year that's behind us and the one that is to start on Saturday of next week, it's only appropriate that we bring our concerns, our joys before the Lord and we ask his blessing and thanks on a year that was had and a year that will be looked forward to. So let's bow our heads in a time of congregational prayer this morning. Father God, once again, we come before you this morning thanking you for your blessing. Father God, we stand, we sit in awe of you because you are indeed an amazing Lord. Father, we see your work in our world all the time. We see it through the changing of the seasons. We see it through the gift of family and friends. We see it through the gift of your church. We see your blessings through the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who was born to us for your glory and our salvation that we have just remembered in this last week. In other words, Father, for all those things that you do for us and all those blessings you give, Father, we praise you for all those things because you are indeed a mighty and overwhelming and awesome God who deserves all of our praise. And yet at the same time, Father, even though our entire being should be devoted to you in everything we say and do, just like we have already spoken this morning so often, Father, we put ourselves first and you second. In short, Father, we have a tendency to put our desires above your own, to put our glory above your glory, to focus on us rather than you. And when we do those things, when we are tempted into those things, Father, we end up sinning against you and we end up breaking your heart time and time again. So, Father God, whether it's as individuals here in this place or watching at home online, whether it's us as a church who have somehow not followed your will and broken your heart, whether it's us as a community that have sinned against you, in whatever ways, Father, that we have sinned and broken your heart, we bring those sins before you and we ask for the blessing of your forgiveness by your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, the beautiful part about you is even as we confess our sins to you, we have assurance. We have assurance of salvation by your Son, Jesus Christ, because he was not only born to us as we remembered in this season, but he will die for us as we will remember in a couple of months. And it is because of his death on the cross that not only did he bring you glory, but he purchased our salvation from the depths of hell. And for that, Father, we thank you. We thank you that we can come in prayer to you, casting all of our praises, our concerns, anxieties upon you and the cross, knowing full well that your son, Jesus Christ, has forgiven us for our sins, intercesses for us on behalf of us. He sits at your right hand, pleading our case with you, Father, even as we speak now. So, Father, we are thankful for all of those things the blessing of your son, the blessing of church, the blessing to worship you freely. But Father, those are not the only reasons we are thankful. We are also thankful for the gift of family. Father, in my own family, we were blessed with my nephew Theo. I thank you for the blessing that he is and the blessing he was to Jamie, my sister. I thank you for the birth that she has given to him 
And I thank you for being with her and all of us as a family in that process. Father, we thank you for this congregation that this year has seen a blessing from you. We thank you for the families that are here in order to listen to your word and praise your name. In short, Father, we thank you for this church because it is your church and the work you do in it. Yes, Father, there are many things to be thankful for, especially in this season where we remember your son, Jesus Christ. And indeed, Father, we do thank you for that gift and we thank you for the year that we just had. Now, for some of us, 2021 was a hard year. For others, it was a joyful year and we watched the news, we looked at society. There were a lot of challenges, but Father, you did not toss away your people. You were with your people through it all. And for that, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the times that we could see you at work throughout the year. And even the times when our eyes weren't open and we couldn't see your work, you were still there. So, Father, we thank you for your presence in this last year. And, Father, we pray for the year ahead. We pray once again that we would be a church who puts you above all else. We pray that we as a society would be blessed by you. We pray that we as people would follow your will and work towards your own goals for your glory. In short, Father, we ask that you would bless the year ahead, not just in terms of this church, but every church. May this be the year where all of your churches raise up and praise your name boldly so that the world knows about your son, Jesus Christ. In short, Father, may 2022 be the year that we proclaim you and do it well. Father, that is not the only thing that we ask for in the coming year. There are many of us in this congregation who unfortunately are struggling with health issues right now. Many of us have struggled with either COVID or the effects of it. Many of us are struggling with intense disease, whether that be cancer or some other form. We think of Jamie Negus' dad as he is continuing the struggle with that colon cancer. We thank you for the successful surgery that he just had, and we ask for continued health for him and continued health for him moving forward. We ask for a blessing upon his family as they walk with him during this difficult time, as well as we ask for a blessing upon Doc's family as his sister is going through some health problems right now. Father, we request not only continued healing, but also strength for her in the coming days ahead. Father, we also ask for strength for David, Barb Hippa's grandson, who unfortunately on Christmas Eve had a severe injury to his arm. We ask that you give him peace during this time. We ask that the recovery would be short instead of long. We ask that you would continue to bless the hands of the doctors as they work with him. And indeed bless the Hippa family as they have so much going on during this holiday season. Father, if at all possible, remove the burdens that they face and may it be replaced with peace and joy and hope for the future. Father, we think of Mary Baker's granddaughter, Genesis, and all her health issues with her lungs. We ask boldly, in the name of your son, if it be your will, that, the, that Genesis, her granddaughter, Sarah's daughter, would be healed. She could be taken off the ventilator and she could breathe under her own power. Father, these are just some of the prayers, some of the concerns that are brought before us this morning. These are just some of the things that weigh on our hearts. Now, Father, I don't know every single thing that's going on in the congregation. I don't know every prayer request your people have, but the beautiful thing, Father, is that you do because you're God and you know our prayers even before they are said. So, Father, whatever has gone unspoken, whatever is lying on our hearts this morning, we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you would grant those prayers as you see fit, that you would bless those who are speaking them. And Father, we ask that all that you answer would be in accordance with your will and the will of your Father by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, this morning we end by saying thank you. We thank you for listening to our prayers in this moment. We thank you that we can praise you. We thank you that we can come to your throne and lift our concerns 
and they are being answered by you. For all these things and so much more, Father, we thank you. And Father, we pray that we would continue to thank you in the days, weeks, and months ahead as we look forward to a new year. We pray that we would thank you every single day. We would praise you every single day. And we would put you first in all we say and do. Thank you, Father. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So let it be today we shout the hymn of heaven. With angels and the saints we raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. We're going to be seeing that here in a second. And as Jesse was giving that message, the idea of paying God back for what he has done is constantly on my mind. I hope none of you are as a guilty person as I am and have that thought. Jamie Negus is wonderful, one of my favorite co-workers, sorry, Jesse. And he constantly reminds me that we can't pay him back. And so what do we do? We praise him. And that's what we're going to do to close out this service. So if you will stand and continue worshiping and thanking him for being that God for us.
our story's just begun Fail you want to find me Cause that's what my father does Fail you want to find me Cause that's what my father does Friends of Jesus Christ, it has been a pleasure worshiping with you all this morning. I encourage you to do a couple of things. First of all, if you need uh, prayers, it's going to be by that cross back there right after the service. And second, I ask that you join us next week where we continue our series on the Ten Commandments. We're look, going to be looking at the second commandment, thou shall have no idols, and how that applies to us in our daily lives. But until we see each other again, remember two things. First of all, in everything we do, let's be that church that goes and puts God first. And second, have a great, fantastic new year. Please don't do anything stupid, okay? Oh, have, a safe, have a safe and fun new year. And remember, in all we say or do, put God first. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them.